Hello, welcome to the Office of the State Historian's Tertulia Historica Lecture Series. I'm Rob Martinez, State Historian, and today I'm going to talk to you about a history of the Catholic Church in Spanish colonial New Mexico, the late period. So, here we go. Let's go back in time to biblical times. Uh, let's go all the way back to the traditional story uh, that after the execution of Jesus Christ, the uh, apostles scattered throughout uh, the Mediterranean world to spread the gospel. It said that St. James the Greater went to Tarshish, what was believed to be Spain. And while he was there, he was having a difficult time converting those cabezudo, hard-headed Iberians to Christianity, to the new religion. Um, a story developed that Our Lady, uh, Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, appeared while she was still alive by locating uh, to Spain, carrying with her the pillar uh, that Jesus was scourged on, and that she helped uh, James to convert some of those Iberians. I don't know how successful he was. Apparently he converted about 12 of them, a good apostolic number, but that was uh, the beginning of uh, Christianity in Spain. Santiago, Santiago, St. James. Uh, this cult or devotion to St. James is very important in the development of Spanish Catholicism. Um, it said that uh, St. James returned to Palestine, to Jerusalem, and there suffered martyrdom. He was beheaded. And another story developed that his remains were taken uh, through the Mediterranean, up the coast of Spain and Portugal, present-day Spain and Portugal, and his remains were buried in northwest Spain, later to be discovered by a peasant who saw stars over a field, uh, Campo de Estrella, Compostela, and once his remains were found, um, the site was a, became an area of devotion. Uh, a chapel was built there, and pilgrims, pilgrims started to uh, make pilgrimages there uh, to uh, ask for favors and to pray. Now, we have to remember that in the year 711 AD, uh, the Muslim Moors uh, invaded Spain, and so therefore, um, it's interesting that during this Reconquista period, starting in the 700s, uh, they say that Santiago started to appear in battles uh, with the Catholics who were fighting the Moors, trying to retake the Iberian Peninsula from those Muslims. So this cult of Santiago de Compostela develops over the centuries, and what comes of it is a military, militant form of Catholicism um, that uh, will be crucial in helping the Spaniards uh, conquer uh, the then known world and move into the Americas and Asia. So this Reconquista period is very important. This image of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe is very important. This is one of the significant devotions to Our Lady uh, that are uh, brought to the Americas. This one is in Extremadura, Spain. The story goes that this statue you're looking at was uh, buried either by a priest or a, a shepherd or a peasant in the 700s when the Moors invaded Spain. And um, the reason they did that is they did not want the statue destroyed or desecrated by the Moors. So this little statue of uh, the Virgin Mary and uh, the baby Jesus was buried. Well, again, these pious legends evolve and develop, and the story goes that um, during the Reconquista, a shepherd was uh, taking his flock to this same area. Uh, one of his animals died, but then came to life right at that spot and the shepherd dug and found this statue and took it to town where they placed the statue in the local church uh, to be revered and venerated. Well, the story goes that the next day the statue disappeared and when they went back to the original spot where she had been found, 
there the statue was and the message was that she wanted a temple or a chapel built on that spot. So that is how uh, this uh, devotion begins in the Middle Ages and what happens later on uh, in the 1400s and then into the 1500s and 1600s is that um, soldiers and colonists who were leaving Spain to go to far off lands such as the Americas or other parts of Europe, they would go to uh, this uh, pilgrimage site of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe in Extremadura in order to pray for blessings and for success. This devotion will become very important, we'll see later on in Mexico. This is a map of the moving border or La Frontera uh, that took place in Spain uh, between the 700s and the 1400s. Um, in the 700s, the Moors overran most of Spain, and it was only those northern areas in Asturias or Cantabria where the Catholic Christians were able to maintain a stronghold. But over the centuries, there was a slow back and forth uh, battle uh, conquest where the uh, Christians started to slowly retake Spain, and you can see from the map. Um, the 700s into the 800s, the 900s, the 1200s, and then of course the 1400s. It would take a couple hundred more years uh, for the Spanish Catholics to take Granada, but that would happen finally in 1492. Um, and it was during this medieval period that a lot of the government and religious institutions that would be brought to the Americas were developed and created. The early church in New Spain, Mexico, from the 16th century to the 17th century. After Hernán Cortés and his soldiers take Mexico between 1519 and 1521, uh, it becomes a military operation, an economic operation, and a religious operation. But it won't be until the 1530s that official uh, Spanish government is really put in place with a viceroy, a virrey, a vice king, uh, Antonio de Mendoza, and the first uh, bishop of Mexico uh, is put in place, um, Fray Juan de Zumarraga, a uh, Basque a Franciscan. He's the bishop who uh, is uh, at the center of the story of uh, San Juan Diego and the appearance of Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1531, but he's also the apostolic uh, uh, inquisitor. Uh, he's the uh, bishop who has inquisitorial authority, and um, he runs into some trouble uh, in the 1530s when an uh, Indian who he was uh, interrogating and putting on trial for dogmatizing, uh, preaching against the Catholic faith, uh, was accidentally killed. So it's during this period that the Inquisition uh, is no longer uh, having any jurisdiction over Indians, uh, only over Spaniards or mixed bloods and baptized Catholics. So what we need to know about this period in uh, Mexican history is that incredible union of Franciscan Catholicism and Guadalupana faith. That devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, Tepeyac, Mexico, 1531. Whatever one's belief, whether this is uh, an actual apparition, which is an article of faith for Catholics, or not, um, we do know that Our Lady of Guadalupe has a very significant role in the development of New Spain and later in Mexico. Um, if you remember, back in Extremadura, the statue of Our Lady was uh, very dark, almost black, and the baby Jesus as well. Well, what's significant about uh, the Mexican Our Lady of Guadalupe is if you look at her features, she's Indian. She appears as an Indian. And why this is important is this. First of all, the Criollos, the Spanish people born in the Americas, were often treated uh, not so good by Spaniards born in Spain, peninsulares. So what this did, this apparition first, gave them uh, the notion that their homeland, uh, Mexico, is also a holy land, just like the holy lands found in Spain and Italy 
and Palestine and other parts of the Christian world. Secondly, the growing class of mestizos, half Spanish, half Indian, these folks were considered illegitimate on so many levels, not really belonging to the Spanish class, not really belonging to the Indian class. So what Our Lady's appearance does for them as it is it legitimizes them as a integral part of the colonial society and population. And finally, and maybe even more significantly, it showed the native peoples, the Indians, that they were also children of God, that the mother of God is them and is like them. Again, this is very important because uh, centuries later, during Mexico's independence, um, this image of uh, the tilma of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe, will play a very important part in developing Mexican national identity. I want to say something about the Franciscan order because they are the authors of New Mexican Catholicism, along with that Guadalupana element. Um, this order was established in the 1200s uh, by Francis of Assisi, and um, it's significant that um, they come to New Mexico because they are the first uh, religious Catholic order to come to Mexico. Later there'll be uh, Augustinians, uh, Dominicans will go to South America, Jesuits will show up as well, all very important, but we have to remember that in that period in the 1500s, these religious orders were very competitive with each other um, as to who would be the first to convert native peoples and to serve them and to shape their Catholic identity. This image comes from the altar at Chimayo, the Santuario de Chimayo, and if you look, there's a uh, cruciform there in the center. Um, you see the arm of Christ uh, coming from the left-hand side uh, with the wounds, and then uh, the arm of Francis with the blue robe and his stigmata. Uh, he was not a priest, but he nevertheless, he suffered from the stigmata, the wounds of Christ, and then below are the three nails from the crucifixion and the crown of thorns. And there, uh, an image uh, by Mr. Cisneros, uh, artist of uh, Franciscan with his donkey going on missionary work. This is a map of the Camino Real. There were many Caminos Real as royal roads, but this one, if you look at the bottom, starts in Mexico City and it winds its way north. Uh, through places like Aguas Calientes, Zacatecas. Um, imagine that map I showed you earlier of, of Spain with the moving border slowly going southward. Well, this is the same thing. Spanish influence moving north along routes that were already used uh, by native peoples for centuries uh, for movement of uh, people, travel, uh, trade, but here you see the development of uh, Spanish America in this area of Mexico and New Mexico. Um, it moves up into um, Durango, uh, Chihuahua, Paso del Norte, then you see on the map Albuquerque, and finally Santa Fe. So this border, this frontera, starts to move northward uh, in the 1500s, well into the 1600s. So let me say a word about Catholic priests in early New Mexico. If you look at these dates, you'll see that priests in the 1500s, Franciscan priests, were explorers. Yes, they were uh, administering sacraments to native peoples and to the Spanish and Mestizo population and the Casta uh, racial mixed people in New Spain. However, look at this, 1539, this marks the first official exploration into New Mexico, um, led by Fray Marcos de Niza with Estebanico, the African Moor, the official first representatives to the pueblos of New Mexico. Fray Marcos, it looks like, was French from Nice, and that Fray means he's a Franciscan, a member of a begging order, a mendicant order. Never call a Jesuit a Francis, a fry or a friar. Um, 
This is for your begging orders. Um, in 1542, at the end of the Coronado expedition, was a, which was a bit of a debacle, um, three priests were left once Coronado and his soldiers left to go south after they failed to find the mineral wealth they were looking for. Um, these three priests were promptly killed by the Native Americans and it's no wonder the Spanish soldiers had killed uh, many Native people around Tigue, a series of communities near what's today Bernalillo, north of Albuquerque, burning them alive. So these priests didn't have much of a chance, but it was a slight beginning for missionary work in New Mexico. It would be about 40 years in 1580 when another expedition would come up here, uh, uh, Chauscado and Rodriguez. There you go, Fray Agustin de Rodriguez, a priest exploring, uh, trying to get an idea of the Pueblo world. And 1580, that's about the time we get our name, La Nueva Mexico, the New Mexico, named after the city of Mexico to the south. The idea being that they were hoping they'd find another Mexico, a new Mexico. So that's where we get our name. And finally, in 1598, when Juan de Oñate brings a Spanish conquest and colonization to New Mexico, he has uh, about nine friars with him. Um, he wanted 12 to have an apostolic number, but um, it didn't quite work out that way. But this is the official beginning, 1598 of a somewhat permanent Catholic presence in New Mexico. There's an image of uh, the Franciscan missions by the 1620s. They are uh, established in most of the Pueblos. Some of the Pueblos are more accepting than others. Um, there's a, a lot of controversy over it. Acoma Pueblo after a battle takes place in 1599 and uh, there's a brutal punishment handed down on the proud Acoma people because they would not submit to uh, Spanish uh, political and Catholic uh, dominion. But nevertheless, this is Acoma right here. Um, this church uh, is a Franciscan fortress church. It looks somewhat similar to the picture at the beginning of this presentation, the Visigothic church in Asturias. And this shows the convento in the foreground, the area where the priests and their servants and probably some soldiers uh, live uh, during their tenure at these missions. This is a computer-generated uh, recreation of what Chaco Canyon uh, probably looked like in its heyday. Um, while uh, Europe was experiencing its high Middle Ages, uh, the ancestors of the Puebloan people had an amazing system of economic, political, and spiritual centers. And if you look at this, this shows apartments uh, in a half circle on the edges of this community, and it's huge. If you've ever been to Chaco Canyon, it's quite spectacular. And the circular structures uh, you see in the center of this community uh, are the spiritual centers of the Puebloan people, the Kiva. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, these Kivas would be uh, replicated when the descendants of these folks end up going to uh, where we have Pueblos today along the Rio Grande, uh, as far east as Pecos and as far west as Acoma. But these Kivas are their spiritual center. This is where they go to practice their rituals, uh, to pray, chant, and then the dancing would take place out in the open. So it's important to know that um, these folks already had a religion and they already had their own religious structures in place when the Spanish arrived with their uh, Catholicism. It's interesting to note as well that the Spanish in early documents would often refer to these kivas as mesquitas or mosques. They were bringing back their memory of the Moorish Wars in Spain and they would apply it to anything they saw that was foreign to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a map of the missions of New Mexico. This is around uh, the eve of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 and you can see um, that this mission system stretched all the way from what's today Juarez El Paso in the south, north along the Rio Grande to Taos. 
there's uh, Pecos and Picuris, San Juan, uh, Isleta, uh, Jemez, Cochiti, all of these pueblos were here and each pueblo had a mission church. Um, there had to be a certain amount of accommodation going on with the pueblos because you did not have a lot of priests at each pueblo, one priest, maybe two, and you did not have a lot of soldiers there. Um, they had a couple of soldiers, a few soldiers stationed, and the Hispanic people tended to live in places like uh, Santa Fe or Alburquerque or Guadalupe del Paso, and some of them would live in the area of the pueblos, but the Franciscan priests did not want the Spanish people living too close to the pueblos. They felt that the Spanish were not very good examples of Catholics and they did not want their bad example rubbing off on the Pueblo people. This is an image of Our Lady that was brought by a priest in the 1600s, Fray Alonso de Benavides. He came in 1625, he was the custos and therefore the agent of the Inquisition, the first official agent of the Inquisition, and he comes to New Mexico, he reads Edict of Faith in the church in Santa Fe, and he starts doing some uh, report taking uh, by citizens who complain about each other. Uh, there's some superstition, there's a lot of belief in witchcraft and love magic, but he brings with him a little statue of Our Lady that made its journey from Spain to New Spain and then he brings it up to New Mexico. Um, during the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, she is taken by citizens and when those survivors of that revolt flee south, she goes with them. She's not call, called La Conquistadora at that point. She has different names. I believe one of them was Our Lady of Remedies, um, Our Lady of the Rosary. But the revolt of 1680 is significant because it's a revolt by the Pueblos against the Spanish political, economic, and religious systems. And it was a revolt for cultural survival. Um, they needed to do that in order to preserve their language, their religion, and their society and culture. So what happens during this revolt, which took place in August 1680? Um, hundreds of priests, men, women, and children were killed. Survivors end up being uh, driven south, and they go to Guadalupe del Paso, where they are in exile under uh, Governor Otermin. Um, they're there for 12 years, but what happens is the um, Reconquista takes place uh, a few years later in 1692 under Diego de Vargas. He brings a Spanish rule back, a Spanish Catholicism back, and Spanish colonists, but also a new understanding of how to live amongst the Pueblos. I don't want to say that it's perfect, it's not, there's still stress. In 1696 there's another attempted revolt that Vargas puts down, but there does have to be a certain amount of back and forth accommodation, much like you probably saw in Spain uh, before the 1400s where you had uh, convivencia, uh, a kind of an uneasy uh, coexistence between uh, Catholics, Jews, and Moors. Well, same thing here. The Pueblos and the Spanish needed each other because the Comanche Indians were on the ascendancy. They were fierce warriors, great horsemen. Um, there were also threats from Apache, Navajo, uh, Kiowa. You, all these nomadic tribes are surrounding New Mexico. And when they bring this statue of Our Lady back to Santa Fe, they gave her the name of La Conquistadora, the conquering lady. Our Lady of Peace now, today. Also uh, being established in the 1700s are a series of churches and towns throughout New Mexico. Um, uh, especially significant is the mid-1700s, around the 1750s, when towns such as Abiquiu, um, Belen, Truchas, Trampas, these are towns on the periphery that Governor Vélez Cachupín establishes as buffers between the Hispanic and Pueblo communities in the center 
of this uh, Spanish colonial enclave and the uh, nomadic native tribes, warrior tribes surrounding the area. So this church, for example, if you look at it, this is uh, at Las Trampas, San Jose de Gracia. In 17, it was established, the town was established in 1751, but in 1760, uh, a rare visit by a bishop from Durango, that's where New Mexico was being governed by as far as being a Catholic entity. Um, bishop Tamaron y Romeral, he comes through the area and he describes the town as a fortress town um, and he talks to the people and they ask for uh, permission to build a church. So he grants them a license or charter to build a church and he asks them to name the church San Jose de Gracia or St. Joseph of the Grace, okay? And you can see uh, this church has that fortress, that sturdy uh, uh, design uh, to withstand attack and the elements. Now, I want to talk to you about Governor um, Ansa, who comes in the 1770s. Uh, it's very important because this is a time where we uh, get to see um, some of the tension that has always been kind of boiling under the surface in New Mexico since the 1600s between governors and Franciscans. Um, it's an interesting thing because in the Spanish system, <clears throat> the crown and the church were married, almost like a sacramental marriage, but like any marriage, there's strife and disagreement. Um, in the 1600s, starting in 1613, a priest by the name of Fray Isidro de Ordonez comes and he starts to get into it with Governor Peralta. Um, they have very public fights, and part of the problem is that the viceroy uh, in Mexico City never really made it clear who was in charge in Mexico. Was it the governors or was it the Franciscans? So when Ansa comes, he already has um, an idea of what he wants. Um, there have been reports about the churches in 1776. Fray Atanasio Dominguez uh, wrote a report on our churches and the people here. And he had a very condescending attitude towards the people and uh, the architecture and New Mexico in general. Um, it's significant that Fray Atanasio Dominguez and another priest, Fray Silvestre Velez Escalante, these are more explorer priests. They take Indians from Zuni and Henisados from Abiquiu and Spanish folks from uh, Santa Fe and they leave Abiquiu area in uh, 1776 and explore north they're looking for a route to California, but they, they don't do that. They, they instead go north uh, into the Salt Valley, and they, they explore the Great Basin. Um, but by the time uh, Ansa comes here in the late 1770s, he has his own mission, and that is to um, rein back what is considered to be the power of the Franciscans. In other words, it's thought that the Franciscans have too much power and authority. So. One of the first things he does is uh, he uh, puts into place the consolidation of the missions. Um, this was done to weaken the Franciscans. When he arrives, there's about 30 mission churches scattered throughout New Mexico at the different pueblos. And when he's done, he reduces that to about 16 missions and about nine um, missions, if you will, sub-churches. Uh, that the Francis Franciscans will have to minister to. Um, this is a problem for them. They, they protest it because this means there'll be less of them needed, but it will also be a money saver. He ends up saving the crown somewhere in the realm of uh, 2,500 pesos, which was a good amount of money back then. A lot of this goes back to that old notion in Spain of the patronato real, uh, the royal patronage where uh, the uh, political ruler, the king, has the authority to appoint religious uh, leaders like bishops. This means the church was somewhat under the authority of the crown. Um, you have that happening here. Uh, um, Caballero de Croix, the Comandante General uh, of uh, Northern New Spain, um, he commissions Ansa with doing this by 
getting control of these Franciscans and weakening their authority. Um, the Marriage Pragmatic of 1776 is issued, and this is another way of weakening Franciscan power by saying that a couple, before they get married, must either get permission by parents if they're under the age of 24, or they have to at least uh, notify the parents if they're over the age of 24. Um, th this has mixed results. We see in some documents that uh, this happens sometimes, but it doesn't seem to be something that really um, they were able to control. Part of it was that the Franciscans would just go to the Bishop of Durango and ask him what they should do, and he would just ignore Ansa and the uh, civil leaders and say, um, do what we tell you to do. You have the authority. You grant permission. You do investigations, um, uh, marriage investigations, and uh, you have the authority to do this. Um, Ansa also went over went after the Franciscans over uh, their use or abuse of personal service by Indians. Um, he eliminated this, and this caused a big uh, controversy amongst the Franciscans because they were used to having the help of Indians to do their work, to work the land, to uh, work in the church. So this was a problem. Um, another thing that Ansa got involved with was uh, tithe collecting. He went at least two times to Durango with priests in order to enforce the collecting of tithes and it's an interesting arrangement where the governor was given that authority to extract uh, that financial burden from the people and uh, put that towards uh, both church and government needs. Um, one of the more fascinating things that Ansa did was attempt to ban uh, the use of roadside markers, what we see still to this day, descansos. Clearly he failed in this. People uh, in the 1770s and 1780s because there was so much warfare, they would mark paths, trails with crosses where loved ones had been killed uh, by Comanche or Apache Navajo people. But um, clearly he failed in this. Um, and finally, we need to note that um, there was a smallpox epidemic uh, around 1780, 1781 that took down about a quarter of the New Mexico population. Um, uh, there was roughly 22,000 people in New Mexico at that time and probably about 5,000 died. And this also worked in Ansa's favor because he argued that there aren't that many people, this many Franciscans are not needed in New Mexico. So this weakened the Franciscan presence. And you can argue that Ansa's actions uh, really hurt the Franciscans to a point that they never really recovered and it would cause problems later on. Um, so when we get to the late 1700s, um, we, what we see is a problem within the ranks of the Franciscans. Franciscans against Franciscans. And what this has to do with is with the alternativa. This is a system that was put in place in the 1720s because it was felt that um, there was an imbalance between uh, native priests born in the Americas and Spanish-born priests. And the belief was that Spanish-born priests had more power, they had more privilege. So the alternativa is an alternate. Um, the leader of the priests and the application of priests in different places would alternate between Spanish-born priests and American-born priests. Well, what starts to happen uh, in the late 1700s is Spanish-born priests start to complain that they're being discriminated against and that they are outnumbered, that native American-born priests are uh, getting more favors and privileges from church authorities and civil authorities. Um, it didn't help that Ansa himself was American-born, a Spaniard but a criollo, born um, in Fronteras, Mexico. So. Um, you have this tension between American-born Spaniards and Spanish, European-born Spaniards, and this will all contribute uh, to um, what will eventually become independence movements throughout the Spanish world uh, about 40 years later. If you look at this chart, uh, plans for a bishop in New Mexico. 
throughout this period, um, New Mexico did not have her own bishop. Um, when Oñate came in 1598, New Mexico was uh, under Guadalajara. It says 1596 because that's when the planning stages of the uh, colonization of New Mexico were taking place. So New Mexico was originally under the authority of the Bishop of Guadalajara, but even Guadalajara was growing and as the Spaniards went north, um, they had to eventually establish uh, a new uh, bishopric in Durango in 1620. But even in 1602, Juan de Oñate thought of having a bishop in New Mexico. In 1630, uh, Fray Alonso de Benavides, that priest who brought the statue of Our Lady, who became La Conquistadora, he thought New Mexico should have a bishop. 1748, Fray Miguel Menchero uh, thought we should have our own bishop. And Pedro Bautista Pino, who represented New Mexico to the Spanish Cortes in Cadiz, Spain in 1811, he petitioned the King of Spain for a bishop in New Mexico. And finally, when Father Guevara visited New Mexico in 1818, he put forth the notion. Nevertheless, it would not happen. It would not happen for another uh, few decades. It would take the, uh, the United States occupation for New Mexico to finally uh, become a bishopric and eventually get a bishop and then an archbishop. Um, Catholicism in New Mexico in the early 1800s. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about this because um, we know that it's in this time period that we really see um, a, a spike in the operation of Los Hermanos Penitentes and of the Santeros, the creators of our amazing Santero tradition. We're not sure about the origins of the penitentes. Some people think they were here during the Spanish colonial period, yet there's no mention of them in the documents of uh, Father Dominguez or uh, Bishop uh, Tamaron. Um, that doesn't mean that there wasn't anything here. Maybe it was just so normal and accepted that they didn't mention it. However, by the time we get to the early 1800s, we know that they are operating uh, because we have a shortage of priests. There's a crisis in vocations in uh, northern New Spain, what's now Juarez, Chihuahua, New Mexico. So there are very few priests. The Franciscans are weakened and what you start to see is uh, the waning of the Franciscan influence and a push by political and religious officials to have diocesan priests. That means priests that are under the authority of the bishop and not of a religious order like the Franciscans. So, here's what we see. We see New Mexico in a period of transition. What happens is this uh, void is creating a, created, a vacuum. Um, there's a shortage of priests, so local lay religious groups start to fill uh, that void. And the penitentes are the most potent and powerful. Uh, this is a lay group of Catholic brothers, hermanos, who um, chant they pray, they sing alabados, uh, they bury the dead, uh, they recreate the Passion of Christ during Holy Week, sometimes, uh, and most times, flagellating themselves, whipping themselves, carrying large wooden crosses. Um, and some people speculate that this devotion comes from Durango, Mexico in the early 1800s, probably brought by a priest. Um, the Santero tradition also comes about painting bultos and retablos, images of saints, of Christ, uh, the passion of Christ, uh, a very medieval but um, strictly regulated uh, art form that is essentially uh, the uh, scripture and uh, the biblical and Catholic traditions in image form for a population that was for the most part illiterate. But this is where we start to see this uh, group developed. Um, we know by the Mexican period uh, uh, a Mexican bishop visits Zubiria and he does not like the penitentes. Um, he wants them to stop. He calls them a brotherhood of butchers because of the bloodletting. So this group though is here to stay. He tries to get them to stop but they're not going to stop. It's part of the New Mexico landscape by the mid-1800s. I want to talk to you about a man that I find very interesting, a priest named Fray Teodoro Alcina de la Boada. 
I, I find him fascinating because he's a man of the times and he's here during that period of transition uh, from the late Spanish colonial period into the Mexican independence period. So I want to tell you a little bit about him. Um, Teodoro Alcina de la Boada was born in 1766 in Palafrugel in the bishopric of Girona in Catalonia, Spain. Uh, that beautiful uh, tourist town there, it probably looked a little different when he lived there. But um, he professed in 1783, he took the habit in 1785 in Girona. He studied philosophy at the Convento Grande in Barcelona and theology in Girona. And then he came to New Spain. Uh, to be a, a missionary priest for the Holy Gospel province. This was incorporated, uh, he was incorporated 1791 and by 1792 he departs for New Mexico. By 1793 he's here and his first assignment is at Sandia Pueblo and then he eventually served in 13 churches in New Mexico. But what I find more, most interesting is that in 1817, Father Alcina was one of six Franciscans implicated in gambling that led to the financial ruin of a man named Ignacio Elias. In 1820, the citizens of Abiquiu complained that Father Alcina was not performing his priestly duties. In 1822, uh, he attempted to force the sale of the Pueblo's common land and finally, in 1824, residents took the unusual step of bringing suit against Father Alcina to recover tracts of land he had acquired within Pueblo boundaries. In 1828, this is into the Mexican period, Father Alcina escaped expulsion uh, under the order that directed European Spaniards to leave Mexican territory. He was able to do this because he was exempt due to his age, which was older than 60 years old. Um, that was the provision. Um, European Spaniards were expelled in 1828. This is under the new uh, Mexican government. But uh, if you were over the age of 60, because of your age, you were able to stay. In February of that year, he swore an oath before Governor Manuel Armijo of New Mexico, acknowledging Mexican independence, promising to defend the nation and its government against all enemies, and agreeing to uphold uh, the Constitution of 1824 and the laws of the land. So, he lives to see a new day uh, as a Mexican citizen. So, this uh, period of uh, the 1810 to 1820, we see uh, uh, the secularization of the Catholic Church in New Mexico. Um, we need to look at a man named Bishop Juan Francisco Castaniza, who was bishop from 1815 to 1825, and a priest, uh, Father Juan Bautista Guevara. Um, he made an ecclesiastical visit to New Mexico, and um, this is when you start to really see uh, a lot of change in New Mexico. Um, the Diocesan priests again a hostile reception from Franciscans, and you see this bitter uh, rivalry between uh, regular Franciscans and secular priests, between criollos uh, and uh, peninsular Spaniards, and there's a lot of racial overtones going on between these groups, and you even see it in the documents uh, when people describe the uh, local people. Uh, the priests describe the local people as mestizos, mulatos, genisaro Indians, who are now a big part of the population, those non-Pueblo Indians who are somewhat Hispanicized, but nevertheless uh, retain their own culture. So, uh, you have, uh, by 1810, you have priests uh, still with royalist tendencies. They're preaching about being loyal to the crown, uh, and for church people to be uh, loyal to the crown, but when you, the Grito de Dolores in 1810 down in Mexico, uh, Father uh, Miguel de Hidalgo y Costilla, he starts this uh, revolution in Mexico, and it starts to spill over into outward territories like New Mexico. Mexican independence takes place uh, 16th September 1821. That's a a picture of uh, uh, Agustin de Iturbide, the first leader of Mexico, 
And uh, this marks uh, uh, the end of Spanish rule and a change uh, for the people. There's no more uh, racial designation, casta designation, like Espanol, Indio, Mestizo, Mulato. Now everybody's a Mexican citizen. And what we eventually see is uh, the Franciscan period is over and we have diocesan priests in New Mexico. Um, it's quite amazing to see how the priests were talked about, the Franciscans. Uh, I mentioned Guevara's visitation 18, around 1818. By then our population is about uh, 44,000. Uh, the clergy has been Mexicanized. Um, about that time there's about five secular priests and 23 Franciscans, but Guevara says these Franciscans are the dregs and he says that the Franciscans were using New Mexico as a dumping ground for bad Franciscans. Um, he says uh, that the mission churches and the people, their faith, are in a deplorable state of abandonment. Um, uh, he says that the Franciscans have withered on the vine and um, that since there were not enough diocesan priests, uh, there was a crisis of vocations and faith in the area. Religious, political, and social upheaval due to revolution, Napoleon destabilizing Spain, independence movements around the Spanish realms, and liberal attacks on church rights and property ownership weakened the Franciscans in New Mexico and it marks their end. In the 1820s, uh, the early to mid Mexican period for New Mexico, you see the politicization of priests. Uh, the famous priest of Taos, Father Antonio Jose Martinez, is not only a priest who was educated by Jesuits in Durango, but he has that Mexican revolutionary spirit. He wants public education for poor New Mexicans. He educates uh, priests in New Mexico, local men. Uh, he trains them to be priests. And he and another priest, Father Manuel de Jesus Rada, they become politicians. They become political representatives of New Mexico's uh, government in the greater Mexican government to the south. So this is what's brewing in New Mexico in the 1820s and the 1830s. So that by the time uh, the United States clashes with Mexico in the 1840s, uh, you have a certain kind of New Mexican Catholicism and New Mexican Catholic priest in place. So, is that the end of religious conflict in New Mexico? No, not really. Look at these faces. On the right you see the first bishop and then archbishop of New Mexico, um, Jean-Baptiste Lamy. And on the left there is Father Antonio Jose Martinez from Abiquiu. Um, both very intelligent, uh, probably had pretty big egos. Um, they eventually clash over authority, over tithing, and over uh, cultural differences. And that is a talk for another lecture. So there's a photo of uh, our old church, the Parroquia San Francisco de Assis, Santa Fe. Uh, uh, Bishop Lamy would eventually replace it uh, in the 1870s with the stone French church we have now. Um, you can still see part of it if you go into the left, the chapel with, that still has Our Lady of La Conquistadora. So it's still here and uh, the Catholic Church is still here. So this is the end of this talk. Thank you for listening. Um, if you need to contact the Office of the State Historian, there's our phone number, my phone number, 505-476-7911. And there's my email address. And don't forget to visit our website. Uh, we have a new web page. It's really beautiful. All kinds of information, uh, images, and New Mexico history. Thank you very much. Hasta pronto.